Black Girls, where we highlight and celebrate entrepreneurship in the Black community. When we tell our own stories, we can own our own narrative and ultimately continue to pour into our own culture. Um, I'm your host, Michelle Forbes, and today I have with me co-founder of Black and Sexy TV, writer, producer, director, and co-star of Jezebel, now currently streaming on Netflix, and the director of Gabrielle Union's upcoming project, The Perfect Fine, Miss Numa Perrier. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Love you. Yeah. Thank you for being here with me today. How are Absolutely. you? Absolutely. I'm really, really good. Good. I'm glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. So how long have you been in storytelling and what was your first project? Ah, geez. Um, it goes back to my childhood, really. Uh, for As far as storytelling, I've been writing since I learned how to write, you know, at six or seven years old. I, and I was writing novels. I would say my first story uh, was an, a romance thriller thing okay. that I wrote at like, nice. I think I was nine years old. I was in third grade, um, eight or nine. And uh, that was my first project, <laughs> my first uh, writing project with, a, you know, a lot of characters. And I have been writing ever since nonstop from journaling and poetry to stories for myself. And eventually that evolved into writing plays, writing mm -hmm. my first short films, and then everything that, that I've done since. Uh, but that it's been a lifelong thing. I've just, I've always loved writing. I've always loved acting. Um, I've always wanted to pursue acting and then directing came after I put those two things together. Uh, Cause I didn't have a lot of examples of what a director was or how a film was actually made. Um, but I knew that I loved writing and directing from a really young age. Awesome. And I'll always love it. Yeah, it's just in me. Yeah, that's awesome. So um, back in the days of starting Black and Sexy TV, um, mm -hmm. when you began writing material, what space did you see in both the market and in art and in the art of storytelling needing to be filled? Well, when I first, uh, the first short film that I wrote, directed and produced uh, was a personal story called Judy about my relationship with my adopted mother. It's a mm -hmm. short film, it's six minutes long. And I really fell in love with directing through the process of getting that film from script to screen. Mm -hmm. uh, and it became important to me to try to unpack <laughs> the confusion and the fractures in my own life to unpack that mm -hmm. in my films. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the first void that I saw. Like I didn't see... Um, but me making those films was not a reaction to not seeing films like that. It was a reaction to me needing to understand my own circumstances better and me needing to um, express emotions that I didn't feel I had anyone to express them with otherwise, you know, mm -hmm. um, specifically grief, you know, uh, dealing with the loss of a parent, um, mm -hmm. making a film about that helped me to process those things. So that, you know, if I'm going to say what was like the first thing I was trying to fulfill, it would be that trying to understand my own life. Um, then as I started branching out and collaborating more and, and collaborating with the team that ended up creating Black and Sexy, mm -hmm. it became really apparent that there was no serialized episodic content that reflected black people in our everyday lives. Yeah. So that was the first mandate. It's like, whatever we do, it's about the black point of view and it's about our everyday lives. <laughs> and yeah. everyday lives naturally rolls into relationships and love yeah. and intimacy and our sexuality yeah. and all of the places that other shows would never go because we're just kind of there as tokens to service a white story or yep. service another culture's story. Mm -hmm. um, so that was really the first mandate, you know, the first uh, thing that we all agreed on sensibility wise was whatever we do, 
it's about stripping us down to the bare bones of our humanity and putting that out for us to enjoy for the culture, you know, (laughs) um, from the very early days. Yeah. And I, I love that. And I love that you was, that was um, you guys intention to do, because I feel like it totally comes across in the work. And, you know, like I was just telling you the connection that I felt to the material and really just feeling seen that everyday part does come across because it was just the everyday lives of black people living in our blackness, really. <laughs> it wasn't, yeah. um, I about to say, it wasn't, it didn't have that token, that token piece to it. We were full characters and I always just appreciated that for yeah. sure slice of life, you know, and then now I think it's important that we're also reflected in all of these other genre spaces as well. It's Mm -hmm. important that we're reflected in stories about the future, Afrofuturism and sci-fi and really showing, Mm -hmm. you know, how our culture will continue to be leaders as the world and this planet evolves. I think right. that's really important. I think it's important to see us in the horror space, mm-hmm. you know, stripping down horror in a way that's reflective of our culture and us surviving horrific circumstances. It's important mm-hmm. for us to expand on that uh, now. But I think, you know, in the early in the early days of Black and Sexy, and at that at that cornerstone of my filmmaking for sure, um, mm-hmm. that was the nucleus of everything needed to start from there and then go out. Right. Yeah. That makes total sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when, when you sit back and see the fruits, um, which have come from black and sexy TV, uh, platform, whether the people you have uh, written with expanding or actors and actresses you worked with now on even larger platforms, um, what are three things, you know, for sure you and your co-founders did right during the building of black and sexy TV platform? Well, number one is just connecting with talents who are already stars on their way. Even if even if uh, the series that they were starring in were, were some of their earliest work, you could still see that they were stars on their way. You know, yeah. they just needed the platform and the material yeah. and the consistent being seen every single week to, to garner their own fan base. Um, and to also garner the attention of casting directors and other filmmakers and the Hollywood industry at large, really paying attention to what we were doing. Um, that was that was really key, uh, I, I think, to to our success and their success as they kept mm-hmm. going. But they definitely showed up already as stars, just mm-hmm. meeting the right stories, the right characters, the leading roles that they that were not available to them. Yeah. Um, and we had that. That's what that's, <laughs> you know, we that's had right. that. Yeah. We were able to really kind of like service each other in that way and buoy, buoy each other. Um, because without the talent, your show is going to fall flat. But if you have talent and you don't have anywhere to put it, Mm-hmm. your talent will never be seen or recognized. So it was really uh, a good collaboration in that way. So just, you know, identifying talent, being consistent, you know, with the shows coming out weekly, doing more than one season to really, mm-hmm. you know, build that up and work begets work. So yeah. we found a lot of times that, and it would be difficult for us because we'd be in season two of a show or even season three And Mm -hmm. another show, bigger show with bigger budget, bigger production, bigger platform Mm -hmm. will come Mm -hmm. and pluck our stars out. And we want them to go, but we don't want them to go because we need need to build the platform up more. So that, that, you know, became like a constant type of tension. You know, you're going to see that happen. Um, And it's just a matter of how do you catch the platform up to the HBOs who have, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars flowing through to keep their talent. Yeah. So um, yeah, that that became difficult, but I think it was just really a really great marriage between talent and platform all the yeah. way through. And also the full circle, uh, it wasn't just having amazing Black actors in our shows, 
Mm -hmm. Our entire, I became really, really spoiled and in a bubble because our, all of our writers rooms, all black, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, all of the executives awesome. making the decisions, <laughs> all black, you right. know, it was like right. the full deal when yeah. there would be, you know, people huddled around looking at an edit to decide what is finally going to go out on Sunday everyone mm -hmm. in that room is black, you know, so there, there was no doubt about um, people's motivations for race. Right. You know, we had the mm -hmm. same agenda for the culture. Yes. And with the, just having that as a foundation changed mm -hmm. everything, you know, yeah. still went through the same problems, any network, any studio, any production company is going to go through, but you don't have that barrier mm -hmm. of, do, does anyone around me even understand the culture? Does anyone right. around me even care? Is anyone around me going to be sensitive to this? Is, is anyone looking out for us? None of yeah. that was ever, that was never an issue. Yeah. Uh, so I think just, you know, being really clear about that, even though there, there were other people that worked, but it was, you know, 90% us. Right. It's definitely a hundred percent us calling the shots. Yeah. It makes a huge difference. Yeah. And just I was about to say the black and sexy TV and just say unapologetic blackness just it, it made it made you proud. It made you proud to watch. It made you proud to be a fan. It made you, you know, it made you want to support for the culture because if it it feels like it's for the culture. Yeah. So yeah, it's a it's kind of a no a no brainer to to support the material. Absolutely. Awesome. So Jezebel, uh, now on Netflix, as I said, uh, made its world premiere at South by Southwest in 2019. Can you describe how you felt, especially coming off a of Black and Sexy TV platform and coming into that new space? How did that feel? I'm going to tell you so many different emotions because me exiting Black and Sexy to say, OK, I'm going to make I'm going to go focus on my feature film as a filmmaker, I really want the world to hear my story mm -hmm. and, and know my voice um, outside of this brand was kind of like going solo, <laughs> you know, yeah. like when you've been in a really awesome band and you're like, yeah. I, I love what we've done here, but I want to go do this thing that's out. I have something else I want to also do. So yeah. there was that tension, you know, um, and that that feeling of am I going to be okay? You know, mm -hmm. um, I had a lot of insecurity about are people even going to want to work with me outside of Black and Sexy TV? Mm -hmm. um, you know, how much do I matter? As in, how does how much does my individual voice and story matter outside mm -hmm. of this brand that I've helped create and right. lead over eight years? You know, so there yeah. was a lot of. Um, <laughs> there was a lot of fear that I was creating through the entire time I was still moving forward. So to get the call that we had been selected by South by Southwest, which is one of the biggest festivals, um, I definitely cried. <laughs> it felt so much relief. But yeah. first, I, first it was disbelief. It was disbelief at first. I remember I opened my email and I saw the invitation from the programmer. And I said, that's not real. I remember shutting my laptop and pacing around my desk and just saying that, no. And then I opened my laptop again and I read it again. I said, no, that, <laughs> that is, no, what? You know, it was really, it was, it it was, was for you, girl. <laughs> And then I called yeah. Tiffany Tennille, our lead actress, and she was the first person that I told once the once the mm -hmm. shock wore off a little bit, you know, once I returned the email saying yes, because you have to respond and accept the offer. Okay. Um, then I remember calling Tiffany on FaceTime and we were both crying. Like I couldn't even get the words out. She thought mm -hmm. something was wrong oh. when she picked up the phone because I said, ah, 
<laughs> and it's just that relief of not only like, okay, I'm going solo after being in this band. Like, does anyone, is anyone going to care about my artistry? Which yeah. was crazy because I was making films before Black and Sexy, but making yeah. a feature, it's a big deal. It's a big risk. This, what, yeah. this is my personal story. Um, so just knowing that our film was going to have the, a lot of eyeballs on it, a lot mm -hmm. of press around it, um, and really have a chance to really get out there the way it has mm -hmm. was just, it was huge. And I remember I had so much disbelief that even up until the day that South by Southwest announced it publicly, all mm -hmm. of the selected films, I kept thinking that I was going to get an email saying, uh, sorry, we no, this <laughs> wasn't <laughs> like that was a fear. I really had that fear that I was going that, that somehow they made a mistake and that they mm -hmm. were going to let me know and apologize and just, <laughs> it was yeah. just, um, it was a lot. And I didn't know how strongly um, I felt that way. I didn't know that I had all of those mixed feelings, you know, mm -hmm. um, until that happened. But yeah, I definitely celebrated, very happy, but I didn't believe it fully for a while. Yeah, that's dope. Because I really molded myself under the brand of Black and Sexy. Mm -hmm. You know, I really molded myself under underneath that brand, even if I had made films before, I had decided in over the years of Black and Sexy that everything that I would do would be like under that banner. Gotcha. You know? So yeah. to then say, well, actually, no, I think I should I need to do something that's not under this banner. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? And where are you going to land? <laughs> um was was kind of tricky and scary. Right. Well, I know it's a, a couple years off from 2019, but still, congratulations, because yeah. that is a huge. It, it's working out really well. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, before we started, before we started filming this, we mm -hmm. were, you know, how we were just talking about, um, I would love to find a way to bring it all full circle. Yeah. And um, I'm looking for that way now. Yeah, that's awesome. So um, in the story, Jezebel, you dealt with topics such as sex, race, gender, class. Um, some of these topics could be considered taboo to discuss, but you created a story with heart and humanity. Um, how important is it for you to deal with these themes in your writing? It's, it's everything to me. I mean, first of all, you know, with the taboo side of it, um, I really believe part of my purpose is bringing understanding to the misunderstood. Mm. And that was good. That was good. <laughs> that's I agree. something I, I locked into yeah, recently. Yeah. I locked into the language of that. It's like, what is it that yeah. I'm really trying to do? I'm not trying to shock. I'm not trying to just be provocative for the sake of being provocative. I and bringing understanding to misunderstood communities, misunderstood right. people, especially black right. women, all right. the different facets of ourselves that are misunderstood, the choices mm -hmm. that we make that are misunderstood or shamed. Yeah. I'm just like blowing the lid off of all of that. Every mm -hmm. project I do will be blowing the lid off of that in some way. That's and exactly. I'm starting with Jezebel, you know, it's like yeah. the perfect example of a community, sex workers, specifically mm -hmm. black women, <laughs> sex workers, um, yeah. who are shamed, criminalized, utterly misunderstood, uh, just showing a slice of that life, you know, what that life was for me, what that life was and is for many women, mm -hmm. uh, how and why we make that choice, what it's like to be a sex worker, yeah. good and bad, <laughs> you know, all of the things that we deal with in any working community, whether it's sex mm -hmm. work or you're working a, fa a factory job, we're still dealing with race, fair wages, fair treatment, um, gatekeepers, people trying to block us from ascending, yeah. every industry you deal with that. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's important to me to blow the lid off of, of all that stuff. So yeah, 
taboo, bring it on. (laughs) And um, of course the heart is going to be there because I'm always going to scrape until I find the heart in it for myself. And then I'm going to express my heart as, as much as I can in every way I can through, through everything in that film, through the art department, through the cinematography, Mm -hmm. through the music, through the actors I choose, through every choice I make, I'm p- giving you my heart, right. you know, and, um, and and helping bring that understanding. That is my purpose. That's awesome. Yeah, that's so that's so cool to hear because it's so necessary in creation. You know, when when I talk about the the representation, I'm big on just representation of us. And having those stories and having somebody who wants to tell those stories from a heart perspective. Uh, One thing about me, I'm a therapist. I work in childhood trauma. So so the heart of things is really, that's that's big. Exactly how you described why you got into film and and writing and all. That's the exact same reason why I became a therapist. Mm -hmm. Because it was was not, um, not being able to have, you know, my own expression in certain things and learning to deal with my own emotions and really become a therapist was a way to under better understand myself. So Mm -hmm. I I really appreciate, um, you know, that, that heart piece, because I feel like that is the point of connection between us. You know, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a surface person. I'm actually not real good at small talk. (laughs) Um, I like to get to the heart of things and sharing and that um, experience is just, I love it. I love that. That's one of the lenses you look through to create. That's awesome. Well, thank thank you for sharing that with me, and I can feel that from you. <laughs> um, that you, what you're doing is beautiful work, and it's healing. It's thank healing you. work, and um, and I really really connect with that, and and think that it's just as important as the. It's just I'm taking a different route. You know, I'm taking the entry point of art to heal, <laughs> to yeah. expose wounds, and then heal wounds, and you're taking this route and it's, um, and they work together. So I think that's really important work. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. I really appreciate that. And not like you, like you said, marrying on what you're doing now with black and sexy, I'm trying to marry what I do now with writing as well. So <laughs> we're going to, we're yeah, going to see you're right there. I'm sure you have a lot of stories. <laughs> yes, I <will. laughs> Absolutely. So, um, for, Someone who wanted to step in to um, TV and film world, what mm-hmm. first step suggestions would you give them? <laughs> That's always the toughest question mm-hmm. um, because there are so many tickets to the party. So I think the first thing is figuring out like what, what your ticket is. Yeah. Uh, for me, it's been creating my own work. There hasn't been anything, there have been very few things that have not been self-generated. I'm very big on that. Um, Not stopping (laughs) and and making your own work. But, you know, the question then is, well, then how do I make my own work? You know, and for me, it, it was a process of constantly writing my entire life, having all this material, <laughs> all yeah. of, you know, I have dozens and dozens of those spiral notebooks, notebook, like yep. any, girl, any true writer has, you know, like yes. they've just been just writing things forever. <laughs> they have all these notebooks everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and then not just keeping that to myself, actually branching out and connecting with other people. I made a very clear decision at some point, I, I don't I don't remember how and when it clicked, but uh, what I can share is I made a decision to just start going to different short film festivals, different mm-hmm. film festivals, and connecting with other artists. So I would go, and if I saw a film that I liked, I would then you know connect with the director or the writer or the cinematographer, and mm-hmm. just that's really how you know the team of black and sexy came together all of us just kind wow. of reaching out for like-minded people yeah. and then saying you know 
now that we've kind of found this group that feels like they're clicking, how do how do we then start creating things out of that collective? Right. Um, so it's a, so it's a tribe. You know, it's about finding your tribe. It's about finding collaborators mm -hmm. to get what you have written in those books <laughs> into <Wow>. a film. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to actually, you know, and so if you don't know how to do all of the pieces and nobody does, it's really mm -hmm. important to start connecting with people until you find your tribe, your, your creative collective to do things with. Right. Uh, that's how you make that next step from keeping everything that you're writing to yourself mm -hmm. <laughs> to yeah. actually sharing it with the world. <laughs> Yeah, you gotta you gotta find your group, you know, and you're mm -hmm. only gonna. It's like, how do you go and make friends? I didn't go to college, mm -hmm. so I didn't have. You know, you hear a lot of stories of really successful filmmakers who they're still working with the people they went to college with. Why? Because in college, you make part of your training is mm -hmm. making films, and so you see who you click with and who you don't by making those student films together, mm -hmm. and then you know those can be lifelong collaborations. I didn't. Mm -hmm. Have, I didn't go to a university, I didn't go to any college, but I did connect mm -hmm. with people in my acting classes and the dance classes I took, and mm -hmm. also by going to film festivals. Mm -hmm. um, for us, you know, looking for other Black people to collaborate mm -hmm. with, I went to like every short film festival I could find mm -hmm. in LA. And if right. I saw a short film that really sparked to me, I'm like, well, they're at the beginning of their career, I'm at the beginning of my career. Okay. And then, you know, it's like, hey, let's make a movie together. I have right. this thing I wrote, you know? So I think that that's one of the missing pieces and like the sun keeps coming in. So <laughs> um, uh, I think that's one of the missing pieces of, you know, just make your own stuff. It's like, no, find your team, find your tribe and then make something together. Right. You know? And then yeah, keep absolutely. making things together and right. keep, keep going along that path. Um, but yeah, that, that's my biggest advice is find your tribe and make your own stuff. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, you know, you know, some, some people, it might work for them to apply to a lot of programs where they might get selected and then kind of put into a pipeline. Mm. That has not been my path. So right. I can recommend that path because mm. I don't know that path. Yeah. Um, my path has been tribe and self-generating <laughs> yeah, yeah. or between those two right yeah I heard it definitely so I actually um wanted to mention back in uh Jezebel because I heard you mention a few times that it actually is your story and I had a question about that so since you were able to share um Jezebel was not only a story you had written but a story you lived yeah. what advice would you give a writer struggling with being honest in their material now, how important do you think honesty well, is? I mean, that is the, the call to action. And it doesn't mean that every writer has to explicitly detail things that happened in their life, but you do have to explicitly detail your emotions in any character you create. You know, your, uh, it's going to, going to require fibers from you. Mm -hmm. And you cannot back away from that. That's why we get paid the big bucks when we finally do is because we're not backing away from that. We're opening, our, opening ourselves up to all of the criticism, all of our ugly parts, all of our beautiful parts and letting people kind of decide how they feel about that. You mm -hmm. really have to be in a state of like, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> yeah, I'm about to say that. Yeah. yeah, it has to be more important to you to express mm -hmm than it is to second guess and, and retreat because you don't know how it's going to turn out. That, that's just mm -hmm. slowing you down. Mm -hmm. um, you, you have to just develop that. I don't give a fuck. You, you mm -hmm. have to be willing to be seen and heard as a writer. And right. I think that as a writer, sometimes it gets a little confused because writing is, is so, such a private thing, yeah. you know, that it's, um, well, I'm just doing this private thing and it's like, no, you are actually exposing yourself right? <laughs> as a writer. And so yeah. you got to get into that. You got to, yeah. you got to know that and you got to get into that. Um, but take the time that you need and have the support 
the proper support around you to do it. You know, uh, with Jezebel, it's not like I went from being a cam girl to making my movie back to back. Mm -hmm. You know, I was a cam girl. I had a lot of experiences in that. I wrote about it. I put it away. I made other films on other subjects about mm -hmm. other things that were personal. So I did, I did work that muscle of telling personal stories, but I didn't return to the Jezebel story till many years later. So that doesn't mean it. you need to take a lot of time off in between, but if you need a little distance from something um, that's hard to unpack or where there's trauma, then give your, then work on a different project, come back yeah. to that project when you've done some of your own healing around that before you, you know, do that. Right. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just, uh, part of the job. You gotta have skin in the game as a writer. You look at all of the great writers, they all have skin in the game. Yeah. It's true. It's true. And my uh, my next question is actually about, you know, fearlessness. But I was going to say, just um, watching, just watching Jezebel, that opening scene, I was like, oh, Numa, we going there. I was like, <laughs> I was like, I was like we're, we are going on a ride. What do you have for me? <laughs> yeah. So, but I always was, knew the movie got to open with a bang, you know, like yeah. you guys are going to know where you're at. It's not going to be, it's not going to be a, um, it's not going to be a slow burn, even though the movie right. is a slow burn. Uh, that opening scene is not a slow burn. Like, you wow. know, you've entered an intimate, sensual, yeah. erotic space. Right. And you're going to stay in this space for um, about an hour and a half. So just uh, get, get into <laughs> it. <laughs> but kind of like you, I'm not big on small talk either. Okay. And that translates to the way I work as a filmmaker. I okay. like to just open with a bang. Yeah. That's what I yeah. like. <laughs> so <laughs> you see that in every yeah. film I do. Like, I don't think you'll see, well, we'll see what I do, but um, mm -hmm. I like to op I like to open with a bang. Yeah, yeah. No matter what it is, yeah. I mean, to have to have written that and to have acted the part, it's vulnerability. I'm like, that is a level of fearlessness. Like, it is just. We had a, we I, had a lot I of that. I mean, I had a lot of trust in my DP. I had a lot of trust in in the team. We had a very small team working on on it. Um, mm -hmm. But I remember when I was filming that, I just had to just. Let it go, you know, like yeah. like no any of my inhibitions because of one okay. thing that I just have to stay committed to is any time that there is a sexual, sensual, erotic mm -hmm. moment um, that it rings true, you know, mm -hmm. that people feel aroused. I you know, that. everyone might not feel aroused, but yeah. but it rings I'm true. Sure somebody feels <laughs> they need to feel it in their body, you know. Right. I'm really committed to that in my work. Yeah. As well. yeah. Um, because I think it's really sad when erotic moments ring false. Yeah, I get that. So your, as I said, your fearlessness comes across in your acting, your writing, and even your photos. Um, have there been points in your career where you were not as fearless as you appear to be now? Hmm. I don't know. I want to say no. I want to say that I've always been fearless. Um, I'm then where did it come from? How about say in that case? <laughs> where did it come? I mean, I think I don't know where it comes from. I, you know, that's a very good question. I don't know. I've always felt. I've always been that way since I was a little girl. You know, I've been really clear about what I want, even though that's become more articulate. Mm -hmm. you know as I grown up um but I've always like known what I want and I've always just it's just always been so strong in me I don't know how to just you know I just remember even being a little girl going to my parents and telling mm -hmm. them this is what I want to do we need mm -hmm. to move to this city so I can go to this school wow. because I want to get this training and they were just mm -hmm. like what you know like I was always That's so cool. uh 
trying to push them to do what I, what, so I could get what I wanted. Right. Uh, I don't, I don't know where it comes from. I think that I've just always just had that drive and, you know, that doesn't mean that I'm never afraid of anything. I had told you my reaction was South by Southwest, you know, right. that stuff is in me too, but I just, <laughs> how do, how do I you just jump over fear? it, you know? <laughs> yeah. How do you move past fear? I mean, is there any, is there a mantra you have or anything that you think to yourself? Like, I'm just, I'm, well, you just, you did say the fucking attitude. You gotta be able, you gotta have a level of fuck it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's yeah. You know, I, I don't know how to explain it. You know, yeah. like, I think it is one of those things that you kind of can't teach. Like, it's like, you feel it in you. Like you just feel, mm -hmm. you feel that energy running through you. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like, I don't know what else I would do with that energy. Yeah. You have to create. So, Yes. Like I've yeah. just, I've always been that yeah. way, you know, yeah. I've always been creative and, but also like very driven and very mm -hmm. ambitious. Um, I, I'm telling you, I've felt that energy since I was maybe six years old. Wow. So I, I don't understand anything else. And so when, when I try to kind of like impart that to other people, I have mm -hmm. to remember not everyone has felt that way since they were, some people are on a different path or they're discovering right. they're not ambitious in the same way and that's okay. Mm -hmm. but how do I advise someone like that? Like, I don't know because it's mm -hmm. always just been so strong in me. Yeah, that's cool. So I actually, I had a film festival question but I feel like you kind of answered it. I was gonna ask you, you know, and, and go into a film festival, say you have a script, you're there. What are the three most important things you need to accomplish before you leave that room? Well, I focus on short film festivals because <laughs> in the feature land, you, uh, people are really launching their careers. Uh, you can launch uh -huh. your career off a short film as well, but the, the people working on those films are more accessible to you generally in uh -huh. the short films. So I never went to like any festival like Sundance to network and try to get this direct. I never did that. Um, I went to smaller local short film festivals, people who were in the same space that I was in, you know, just getting started, just having these raw ideas. Um, so for me, it was identifying those short film festivals, attending them, um, mm -hmm. getting, making sure I had all the credits <laughs> for everyone involved in, in the yeah. films that I liked, mm -hmm. um, meeting them there at the festival. Usually they're, they're there, sometimes they're not, but I would, you know, try to meet them and exchange information. Mm -hmm. um, and let those relationships develop from there. It's really about finding your, your tribe and you're not going to if you're just keeping to yourself. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I didn't do it with any of the feature films. Those are much bigger projects and mm -hmm. that's not where I put my focus. I would really recommend, you know, there are some really great short film festivals, especially for us. Yeah. And, um, you know, you can really connect with really awesome, awesome people that are just as hungry as you are. Yeah, um, that's awesome. Well, I, I appreciate you being here with me today so, so much. So to say, I've, I've already given you your roses in the beginning. So. Thank you. I appreciate all my roses. <laughs> I mean, the sun has decided to really, okay, this is better, right? I should. love the sun. It's beautiful, but yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. What, um, what do we have to look forward to from you? Well, I'm doing my first studio film with Netflix, mm -hmm. uh, my romantic comedy starring Gabrielle Union and Keith Powers. Um, that should be filming over the summer, maybe in the fall. It depends what's going on with this uh, crazy pandemic that we're in. Mm -hmm. um, but that is my next film. And then I have a TV series that's still in development. We're still looking for a home for it. Mm -hmm. um, some conversations are starting to move forward. So that's exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's an erotic thriller series that mm -hmm. deals with um, 
an abusive relationship that sneaks up on you. Okay. Uh, that's best. You know, I call it a love story gone wrong. Okay. And, uh, yeah, that, which is interesting because, you know, the film Malcolm and Marie just came out and that's like about a toxic, <laughs> a, a toxic relationship um, and a, a long a all night argument. Uh, mm. Yeah. So I think that there's been a lot of conversation around that film, but it'll, it'll be interesting to see something that deals with a really messy relationship, but mm. in an episodic <laughs> in a serialized way, right? In some form, yeah. Awesome, awesome. So Miss Numa Peria, where can the people find you? <laughs> so that uh, we can follow all the wonderful things you have going on. Well, please follow me uh, at Miss Numa on Twitter and Instagram. I'm pretty responsive, um, as you know. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm she is, I'm just fine with <laughs> I, I really, you know, um, like meeting people on social media. I always have. So I am one of the people I'm good with that. My DMs are open, you know, <laughs> and, and as long as like you come at me respectfully, I, I more, more times than not am really responsive there. So please okay. come say hi. I'm there. Awesome. Awesome. So the last thing I have to have you do, it's Black Boss Tradition. Okay. <laughs> so I love, I love to, um, when I was doing these in person, you know, I would have everyone say their name and say that they're a Black Boss. So now that I do it on COVID, I have to kind of announce it to the person instead of being behind the camera and just telling them. <laughs> oh, got it. So if you can say your name and say that you're a Black Boss to make Black Boss Tradition, that would be awesome. I love it. My name is Numa Perrier and I'm a black boss. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so awesome. Yes, thank you. I like that. Yeah, awesome. write that down. <laughs> <laughs> I have really, really enjoyed our conversation today. You are incredibly inspiring. Um, incredibly uh, innovative, a uh, visionary, um, hardworking. And I really, I really appreciate you. You know, I want you to know that your, that your life, your life is, is, is spreading. It's, it's reaching people. Your Thank light you. is shining bright. My light is shining. <laughs> your light, Thank you. your light is shining very, very bright as the sun in the window is suggesting. Yes, I love that that happened. Thank you so much. Your light is also shining bright. I can Thank feel you. it radiating off of you. Thank it's you been so a pleasure much. to be here. You a black boss too. Thank you. <laughs> yes. So just you know, thank you so much. I really love talking with you. Yes, I really appreciate the conversation. Well, I'm not going to take up any more, any more of your time. I appreciate you. And I will I will be following as I have been doing. So <laughs> I will right. not Let's stop. stay in touch. Let's stay in touch. Absolutely. That'll be wonderful. And I, I hope I hope nothing but the best for you. I'll I'll uh I'll continue to visit the DM. <laughs> yeah, visit my DMs. Okay. I'll talk to you later then. All right. Talk Bye. to you later. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much to Numa Perrier. Um, amazing conversation. That was really, that was, that was an excellent um, experience, honestly. Um, I'm just really excited. I've been a fan of Numa's for uh, well over a decade, you know, since, since I was in college and watching everything that she's done. So I hope that you were able to learn something. Um, I learned a lot and keep watching, keep coming back. Please, for the full episode, um, go head over to YouTube, Black Boss Channel. Um, we have two seasons up. We're in the middle of our second season. And please follow me on uh, Instagram at Black Boss Certified. Thank you so much. Love you guys. Peace. <laughs>